As they settled at Spawn Ranch in the summer of 68, each family member was deputized to take on responsibility. They were there at the approval of George Spawn. Everyone pitched in to make the ranch look more presentable and take care of the animals. Manson asked Lynn to be George's caretaker. That included fixing him meals and reporting everything he said back to Charlie. Lynette also took over the pony ride business, giving her access to Spawn's bank accounts. Then, at Charlie's urging, she offered her body to the elderly rancher. He fell in love with her. He would tell her stories, stories, he called them, from his past, that the milk business was hard work, that Jean Autry was mean and drunk most of the time, so drunk you couldn't get him on a horse. At night, he would call for her. Hep, hep, somebody come quick. She'd be there in a flash. It was George who, after goosing the freckled redhead and hearing the high-pitched squeal she made in response, gave her the nickname Squeaky. Diane remembered. Squeaky became George's number one girl, both in the bedroom and out of it, but all the girls would take turns sleeping in a real bed with George. His house had amenities that weren't in the other buildings, since they were, upon closer inspection, more like shells with facades. Many accounts of the family led us to believe Charlie gave his followers their nicknames. Sometimes he did, like Sadie, but often they were bestowed by George Spawn. For Mary, he employed the Italian, phonetically Mariocha, and Ella was Gellerstone, Brenda Brindle, and Katie, Katie did. Ruth Ann became a wish. One source cited that it was the whistling sound men made when the pubescent beauty walked by. A wish was in charge of garbage runs. She was so young that anyone would take pity on her if she were caught. But all the girls knew that if they were caught, they were to flirt their way out of the situation. No matter who originated them, Charlie embraced the new names. After all, when you give people new names, you take away their past identity. They can belong to you. Oche was probably easier to smack around than intelligent nature lover Mary Brunner. Brenda was stronger and braver than the surfing socialite Nancy Pittman, and eventually Katie would be more likely to stab someone than former file clerk Patricia Diane. Conditions weren't too hygienic at Spawn Ranch. The water system was often not working. The girls broke out in acne and skin rashes. Massive horseflies bit them. There were spiders and rattlesnakes. Plus, Manson constantly had to kiss ass with George with the ranch hands, and with Ruby Pearl. Charlie sometimes wondered if it was worth it. He missed being on his own, hitchhiking up and down the coast, but he also needed the attention his followers gave him. Years in prison trained Manson to find carnal gratification wherever he could. That also meant as quickly as he could when he was incarcerated. With these kids, it didn't matter if he was an inadequate lover he didn't have to be particularly good with an inexperienced adolescent. When aggravated, Charlie became vindictive and petty. He loved to mimic people just to get under their skin or make up crude songs about them. Despite the daytime heat, temperatures at night often dropped low enough to warrant a bonfire out of doors. Manson loved to sit fireside and rap about his philosophies. That summer, the idea of now was top of mind. Now was his interpretation of oodles of spiritual readings, from Native American myths to Buddhist practices, even his auditing of Scientology. Time was immaterial, he warned. Get rid of your watches, your clocks, your calendars. Be present in the now, not mired in the past or dreaming of the future. The whole idea was to let time disappear Pat Krenwinkel explained, there was no time. That didn't mean there were no rules. There were Charlie's rules. 
The only book he permitted was the Bible. No black music was allowed. He also forbade eyeglasses. It's unclear what reasons he gave. Mary, Ella, and Sandy tossed aside their glasses and lived in a perpetual haze of near blindness. But even with Charlie's many rules, Spawn Ranch became a place of fantasy, of playfulness, and of exuberance. It was a timeless existence in an almost isolated setting, as Vincent Bugliosi later elucidated. Squeaky Frome's biographer, Jess Braven, wrote, Living in the fake historical shacks of Spawn Ranch, with the Santa Susana Mountains at their backs, and the city seeming far, far away, the family had found their most comfortable home yet. The setting allowed the magical mystery tour to go to new heights. Pirates, Greek goddesses, servants, princesses, queens, beggars, court jesters, witches, elves, space creatures, mad hatters, minstrels, gypsies, harem girls, angels, and devils. The group would put on cowboy outfits and turn their world into Abilene or Dodge City. In the evenings after the work was done, they'd eat the stews of salvaged vegetables and make love. They'd listen to Donovan, the Moody Blues, and of course, the Beatles. And they'd sing their own songs, Charlie's songs. He would sit on a rock, and the girls would gather around in a circle at his feet. The girls who could sing in the highest registers would cluster around one spot. Those with lower voices would sit by another. Manson still clamored to launch his music career. In June, he again made the rounds of the many nightclubs along the Sunset Strip. Charlie was trying to get gigs most of the time, but he sometimes donned his Chuck Summers persona and pretended to be a talent scout. He was really scouting for more followers, but if he scored recording contacts in the process, that'd be all right too. Chuck Summers' favorite hangout was the Galaxy Club, which he visited in the mornings, according to the club manager. The manager also happened to be a stage hypnotist, who later opened the Hollywood Hypnotism Center, and he and Manson often discussed the finer points of the craft. Greg Jacobson reminisced that if Charlie had come up 20 years later with MTV, he would have been a natural. He was a magic man, and in those days, magic was allowed. Hanging out with him was an event, though you could only take so much of him. I remember, and this is one of very few, more or less, conventional nights, we ended up on the strip, at the whiskey, with Dennis, Charlie, and a huge entourage, some big show going on. Charlie hit the dance floor, and it wasn't but a minute till he'd cleared it. There's too much electricity coming off him. He's just humming, shooting sparks out of his eyes and his head. It was total freedom, and he was moving to the music. If Manson was chomping at the bit to get his record deal, Dennis Wilson and Jacobson were not. They understood the industry all too well and knew that it took hard work, talent, and timing for even the strongest performers to succeed. Charlie just needed to be cool. Dennis continued to enjoy the pleasure of the women, of course. He brought Snake, Oish, and Squeaky to Colorado when the Beach Boys played a music festival that summer. And he again tried to get the Beach Boys to record Charlie. They did consent to performing one of Manson's songs and releasing it as the flip side of their next single. Charlie's tune, Ceased to Exist, was selected by Dennis. Little did Manson know that by the time the song was released, he would feel very differently about Wilson and the Beach Boys. The other Beach Boys hated Charlie and called him Pigpen. They ran a background report and shared it with Dennis. But Dennis wasn't turned off by Manson's criminal record. He thought it made the wizard more interesting. But his bandmates were alarmed. Remember the year before, some of the Beach Boys fell under the sway of the Maharishi. In fact, in late 67, the band planned a tour with the Yogi Master, and Dennis's cousin, Mike Love, was among those who traveled to India in March of 68 to stay with the Swami along with the Beatles, actress Mia Farrow, and her sister Prudence. The Maharishi hit on the women, 
proving himself a charlatan and predator. Once deceived, Love and the others had their guard up in a way that Dennis never would. The other Beach Boys couldn't understand why their drummer would believe that this former jailbird was anything other than exactly what he appeared to be, a grifter with minimal talent. Manson's greatest skill was sussing out people's troubles and then with just a word or a look, offering solutions. He knew that he was a star and he believed that other people owed him their loyalty and generosity, especially those who were already part of the Hollywood elite. 